two things. So I heard some people asking Mike about the, the windows, if you have questions about the multi-seek. Um, also the other two TAs. Uh, I know uh, Juan uses multi-seek a lot, so they should be able to help you. Most important thing is um, we have it all working on those machines in there. I know there's a next step to getting it to work on your laptops. That's step two. But let's just be sure we have, if you want to try out MultiSeq, it's, everything has been loaded, um, all the tutorials, and as I said, you don't want to, you just maybe want to look at a few of them. They're rather long. We have the timings. Um, so I think we sent you a connection to the box. Uh, and in there, we have the, the timings that would take for the uh, lattice microbe uh, things, if it takes uh, the simulations on different cells. If it takes too long, we've pre-computed it for you. So you can run short jobs, but it's two hours of a cell's life, um, I don't think so. Uh, you're welcome to try it, uh, but you might get a little tired. Um, the, so if, it's, if anything is over like an hour, two hours of a cell si uh, process, we have it pre-computed for you. Um, we also have the timings for the uh, multi-seek tutorial. So uh, please do look at that. We'll start off the afternoon session. I was going to ask um, Mike Halleck to go through with you how to get your student accounts up and running on the Blue Water supercomputer. It's a really nice machine. Um, it has these, uh, I think, like, I don't know, 20,000 GPUs. Uh, uh, don't take all of them and don't, you know, uh, I don't think the student accounts will even allow you that. And as of yesterday, we had only one problem that we saw is you can run it and you could visualize it uh, from the machine uh, in Urbana, but it wouldn't allow you to copy over your results to the local machine. And we didn't know if that was a protection uh, that the supercomputer did because you have student accounts normally to get on the supercomputers you have to have one of those security toggles, right? And we were just giving you accounts. So hope no spies in here. Nobody's going to tank the supercomputer. Um, but they, we asked, and I don't know if we got it resolved last night or not. Uh, but it, you can see it on your screen, but you just can't copy it over, at least uh, as of yesterday. All right. So uh, now the people who are going to be helping you with this, I already introduced Mike Halleck, as I said. He's been one of the main developers, along with my graduate students and a postdoc, of our, uh, of our software. So we went from like, oh, we've studied, done MD, MD on all of the components involved in translation. But my god, there are 3,000 ribosomes. How are we going to put that into the cell? And, and actually, it's even worse. That's a slow-growing cell. A fast-growing cell has, hmm, you know, uh, 50,000 ribosomes uh, in it. So how are we going to address those problems? And you're going to see how we addressed it. And as I said, we're really thankful to these guys that they allowed us to have these student accounts um, uh, to do this. OK, so <clears throat> a lot of this work is also done, has been done in connection. We have an NSF center at the University of Illinois. It's called the Center for the Physics of Living Cells. So. Uh, I was telling somebody, if you think it's hard validating molecular dynamic simulations, wait till you do something in the cell. Um, and so we have very good experimentalists here that can help us validate uh, and work with us. Um, like we're modeling of something that they're interested in in the cell, and then we can see if we have the kinetic model correct or not. So that's very important. And through our NIH, uh, center just like here we give out our software so uh, um, all the tutorials that you see are also available on our website um, and I think also along with the with the PDFs of the uh, lectures although Marcus has asked us we'll send what we lectured on today to him and so you guys will get a copy maybe today or tomorrow at the latest okay so let's go ahead and get started so we've been talking for the last couple days about molecular dynamics simulations. And really, if you're going to look at uh, biological modeling, I think it's clear to everybody here you have to do it at different scales, both in length as well as in time. So 
you know, on the time scales, we're sitting up here. We've got everything from atoms, the angstroms, down here to centimeters. So some of the subcellular structures where really NAMD, which you've been using, has made henlides is because they can do these really large systems. And, um, and what we want to focus on more is here, and I'll show you just a little bit of our foray into uh, multi-cells uh, or colonies. So we're, everything that we'll do will be working at the 10 micron level up to the millimeter level. And so if you're doing MD, I think you guys have maybe run enough, you know what the time steps are, typically femtoseconds. So you can get up uh, nanoseconds. You can do microseconds if you do smaller systems. And, and particularly here in Pittsburgh, and you use Anton, you can get up into this regime. But they're normally smaller systems, right? Um, if you want to speed up things, um, then you're going to have to do some type of coarse graining uh, or Brownian dynamics uh, on it. So you lose the molecular detail as you go over here. Everything comes a little bit blockier. So here's the ribosome, the large subunit, the small subunit. There's the ribosome and the proteins that hold it together. Here are the ribosome and the proteins that hold the large subunit together. And over a coarse grain model, they just become two blocks, right? Uh, now, if we're going to go into this regime, of time steps of a microsecond and go up to this level, we're going to have to give up this detail and go to sort of extreme coarse graining if you want. So now we're going to impose on the cell uh, uh, a, sub -la uh, a lattice of subvolumes, and we talk more now about the probabilities of, say, the diffusion of the ribosome, um, it's translating a protein, it's binding with the messenger, or that protein interacting with the, with the DNA. So we're going to have reactions, which is something which is more difficult to do in these two pictures. But we have to give up a lot of the details that you guys have been thinking about. What you'll instead use, if you know you have two states over here, well, you can put two states probability of transitions from either of those states. But you're interpreting the information in a different way. The methodology that I'll talk primarily about it will be called the reaction diffusion master equation. And you may have seen at least the version for the reaction master equation in the chemistry classes, um, but it's not clear. <laughs> so again, femto, uh, microseconds for us and allow us to get up to hours uh, doing this. And in the case of whole cell colonies, we uh, even don't discretize the cell we do 10 micron units of subvolume units. And so then you have many cells within that uh, subvolume. And then we can go out to 30 to 40 hours of growth on, say, agar. All right, so what are these methods, just in case you haven't come across it? The chemical master equation, like uh, if you have reactions going down, I think everybody knows what a zero first and second order reaction is. Um, if you have a lot of material, then you don't need to worry about the fluctuations that you might see in a reaction. But just think of the michaelis menten equation of the reaction. You know that there's never very much of the complex of the enzyme uh, with the substrate. That's always the little small amounts, and you have lots of the substrate coming in. If you want to capture the fluctuations and the appearance of that, you have to use a different method. So now you go over and talk about the probability of your state, or in this case, the probability of the st cellular state. So that's P, and X stands for everything that's in it in your model. That can be you know, substrate, enzyme, RNA, sugars, you name it. And what the reactions do, they take you out of that state, with the minus sign here, or they bring you into that state from all these other different states. Right? So you know, if you have a, a, a uh, a messenger translated, what's the result of that? You gain one protein more in the system. So you're changing the probability. Now, uh, in chemistry, you would tend to do this in an Erlenmeyer flask, and you'd have a stirring bar, and everything would be well stirred. In a cell, it's not well stirred. It looks like this. This is E. coli. This is the architecture we got from one of our collaborators, Wolfgang Baumeister, who does cryoelectron tomography. So they give us the geometry of the cell, the little uh, gray dots are the positions of the ribosomes. 
and the shaded region is where we can infer the nucleoid is, the, the DNA, the circular DNA in these things. And what you're seeing here is a simulation of a lac genetic switch. Here's the gene, the little blips of, of pink are the messengers being formed, and it makes a membrane protein, a permease, that then diffuses along this membrane. So the cell is very noisy. When you do gene expression, that's small numbers game. That's, so you have stochastic gene expression. When this thing switches on, you get thousands of those permeases, right? Or, and if you look at the sugar, the inducer, oh my god, there can be up to a million of those things in there. So you can get drastic changes right, uh, in the populations. And what you try to do with the cell simulations that we'll have you work with is we try to bring in all the experimental information we can. So uh, Baumeister and Julio Ortiz, they're uh, cryo-electron, they do tomography reconstructions. Uh, these next uh, four gentlemen are uh, single molecule people. Uh, Merner got the Nobel Prize for his single molecule studies, so they label things inside of the cell and track them. Um, Johan Elf was a student of Sunny Shi. He was heroic, and he's been labeling, oh, up to a, like a thousand proteins in E. coli, uh, has libraries of them, collected information on them. And uh, Elf looks at the diffusion of the ribosomes, subunits, we use that information. Tay Kip Ha is also a leader in developing new technologies, and he's at our, NI, at our NSF center there in Urbana. Uh, uh, Woodson uh, Williamson are themselves experts on the ribosome, so we use their experiments, uh, the genetics from them, and the pulse chase information from Williamson to make kinetic models uh, of translation. Now, I want to point out, translation, it's universal. We hope, we get it right for one bacteria, we're hoping that it's going to be pretty good for a lot of the related bacteria. I don't want to say all, but a majority of them. So we'll get the kinetic model correct for that, where you see variation from one organism to, to the next, where it's really not canonical at all, or in this metabolic responses and the signaling. Those have to, you're going to have to invest a lot of time in developing good kinetic models or network models for those. So uh, this is if it's well stirred. You'd have just these reactions taking you in and out of that particular state of the cell. Now we have to add to it. We discretize the cell. And now we have diffusion within each of those subvolumes. So now we have another label there. And within any subvolume, we're going to assume that we can use the well-stirred approximation to the reactions within the sublattice volumes. I also want to point out the cell is really packed. This is like a 256 nanometer by 256 nanometer section out of a cell where we have packed it according to the ribosomes we get from uh, count, we get from cryo-electron tomography and other sources, and then plus we put proteins in from proteomics data. And if you start, I had to do a slice of this and turn it on edge to see where space left, right? And there's a lot of space left. It's only about 50% packed. Uh, but those are where your reactions uh, <clears throat> are also taking place. OK. So here are some of the problems that we'll talk about. Uh, and as I said, you really have to go hand in hand with the experiments. So you talk about the simulations. We sort of set them up. Can we capture an experiment? And then can we go one step further and do predictions? And no one system is complete in that we have everything in the cell. And we, I, we can discuss why you can do some time scale separations. But instead, what I'll do is just show you a few of the examples. So this was one of the first one, as I talked to you before, genetic gene expression. You have one gene. It makes a messenger. Messenger gets translated. There can be a feedback mechanism that suddenly makes thousands of these proteins, but it starts off in the basal state with rather a small numbers game. And here, the experiments had done by Sunny Shi, and we did our simulations, and please watch the clock ticking here. We had to simulate this to catch the switching up to about a, an hour, right? And of course, you can adjust the switching time a bit by how much inducer that you bring in, because the repressor that binds onto that DNA that, that shuts off that gene is sensitive to the sugars that are there. More sugar, the less binding it does. But we could describe this whole process 
we put in packing from other things that are in the cell, but we could simulate it using like about 25 reactions and say, I think it was 10 species. If you want to do ribosome biogenesis, like starting with the operons that we talked about in the previous lecture, and there are eight of them in E, no, excuse me, seven of them in E. coli, seven ribosomal operons, and uh, I think also seven for the ribosomal proteins. Uh, if you're going to do that, start with their transcription, then do translation, and then do assembly. That gets you up to already uh, 1,200 reactions, right? And all this information is in there. We'll show you some preliminary results we have on that. Uh, this, these kinds of problems is what forces you to, I can't do something more complex than this if I can't make the job run faster. So we're always tinkering with our software trying to exploit the latest feature of a new GPU. We're just like people on their Game Boys. You know, oh my god, cool game, I can do it, I can do this much faster. You know, because they now have a new GPU in it. And here's the circular DNA, and these are these red spots, those are those seven operons I was talking about. We, we change our, uh, our technique a bit uh, when we go to look at colonies, because now we have about 2,000 metabolic reactions that are going on at each side of these cells, we're going to try and solve these steady state and then update what gets taken up or secreted by the cell. And what changes very rapidly uh, in much shorter in much shorter time steps is the local environment of sugar, oxygen, glucose, uh, things that are secreted like acetate. So this is a hybrid method where you combine the, the reaction to fusion with steady state of these uh, metabolic networks. And what's interesting, the metabolism changes. If you're living in the center of a colony, you're not seeing much, much oxygen. And if you're living at, living at the top of a colony, an agar, you're not seeing much glucose, but you're secreting a lot of acetate. All right, so just to summarize what I told you quickly, when we do the cell simulations, it's, I think it's important to try to put in molecular crowding if you have the information available. People typically ask me, well, just how big of a mistake am I making? I mean, it's not horrendous, not worse than some of the other ones that we make by leaving them out. But everything, if everything counts 15 to 20 percent, it adds up after a while. And you can get better agreement and more predictive runs uh, if you can get that information in there, right? Um, so like, uh, well, I'll give you an example later on. So that means bringing in the cryo-electron tomography, getting the architecture straight, doing single molecule information, getting diffusion correct, how many of them are there, doing STORM, doing qPCR, RNA-seq data, that gives you a ton of information about how many messengers are there at any one time on average. Uh, you can also do lifetime uh, uh, of mRNA. That's fantastic because that was a major problem in doing the genetic switches. Some but people who knew about proteins didn't know about RNA and they had the wrong lifetime in. And we couldn't get any agreement with the experiments until we realized this particular messenger was decaying in a minute, not the, the lifetime of the cell, right? So then if we're doing these kinetic models, you have to have the parameters. We already talked a little bit about how you try to get them from single molecule experiments, biochemistry experiments. Thank God there's been 20, 30 years of biochemistry studying all those individual enzymes in the metabolic pathways. Um, <clears throat> then when we start combining uh, reaction to fusion with steady state, that gets us into this realm of what they call systems biology. You're bringing in much more of the system of the cell. And um, so we can do uh, population FBA uh, and then combine it with the kinetics down here to do the cell. And um, so most of the things I'll be talking to you about have come out uh, Although we started publishing on this software in 2009, on the, that was first couple articles were just dealing with how to get this on a GPU, right? And so, and one of the really highly cited papers is from Mike Halleck. Again, I just know the journal, it's parallel uh, computing, and it's multiple GPU, blah, 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 cell simulations. Um, but it was really telling of how we can go towards what the scientists call in this multi-MPI uh, type of version and make a maximum use of multiple um, uh, GPUs. And then there's Joe Peterson's article about making the uh, Python interface. Mm -hmm. 
You had a question? So on the last slide, so I was just thinking about the second tab, the lattice spacing is about 30 nanometers, which is roughly the size of the ribosome, right? Is that coincidental or is that? <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Okay. Because the ribosome has a diameter of 20 nanometers. And so we had done the, um, we had done the switching simulations with ribosomes in there too, with the crowding there, but we had let them be obstacles because they weren't really involved in the switching process. So I didn't care if the ribosome went over a couple lattice spaces. We just, we took the data from the cryo-EM, fitted, in that case it was a 16 or 8 nanometer uh, lattice. So the ribosome, like in the previous picture, it took over three or four lattice sites, right? Now, for to do ribosome biogenesis, they have to move. And we didn't want to have troubles with, you know, uh, trying to move things over multiple uh, uh, lattice sites at any one time. In fact, the time steps, you have to look at what the range of diffusion coefficients are that are in the model, and you want it so that in any one time step, it doesn't jump over multiple lattice sites, it can move into a new lattice site, and a reaction can take place. So, yes, that is not arbitrary, right? Okay, so how we set this up is we tried to bring in all the experimental information we have, the tomographies to get us uh, architecture. It's really cool because it gives us 3D, which is very difficult to do. Some of this single molecule work from Myrna, that was the beauty of it. He was one of the first that really got good resolution, single molecules in all three dimensions. You have to read in the reaction kinetics, so you're reading a lot of biochemistry textbooks and looking at those articles and then uh, proteomic studies. And there are more and more that are being done, uh, even on the single cell level. You won't see all the components in the cell, but you'll get information about them. And now we have, again, single molecule people are labeling them, and we have uh, libraries of them for E. coli and as well as for yeast. Then we build up our cell, um, we run it, and then we can either send it off to a workstation you can, even if you have the right GPU on your laptop, you can run lattice microbes there. But the problem is you don't want to run one replicate. You want to run as many as you can to get good statistics. So that's why we send it off to Blue Water, so you can at least get 100 or 1,000 replicates, and then you do the, the statistics of them. Because if you're doing you know, stochastic modeling, that means yeah, there's going to be a variation in the amount that you see at any one time, right? Um, so for good statistics, you're going to want to at least run it on uh, a workstation or the Blue Waters. Then you get your uh, s trajectories back, and depending on how long you do this, we we'll could be talking gigabytes of information to come back. And then you analyze it with uh, VMD, or, and, um, and just like you do with your MD trajectories, start making inferences. You had a, did you have a question? Did you say, are the cells dying? Uh, ergotic. ergotic. Um, so if you're doing a single cell, the, the, uh, I, I think what you're trying to use the word is ergotic is, um, good question. Um, we've never been able to run it long enough for any one cell, so that's why, like, for do the, the hour of a life of E. coli, you really should do it for maybe 10 hours or more to see if you get the same answer from doing lots of shorter simulations each of an hour. That we have not done. Um, on small reactions, we have done that, and yeah, that's the same rules the statistical mechanics hold. But re these are very simple systems, right? Um, <clears throat> okay, so then you, uh, as I said, you bring it back and then you analyze it in VMD. And just so you see the typical out input, this is a tomogram that's from uh, Baumeister and Julio Ortiz, his group leader. And you see very clearly the boundaries of the cell, the width, the dots here, I think you can see them. Those are the ribosomes. The shaded area where you don't see dots is the nucleus. Uh, is the nucleoid region, right? Now what's interesting, this is for a slow-growing E. coli, and I have to really stress this, that 
you know, there's going to be so much variation in your cell biology experiments because it depends on the conditions, whether you're giving it lots or little glucose, or is there other compounds, what's your nitrogen source, what's your sulfur source. This is slow growing. It has a doubling time of about 120 minutes. And I, we were lucky that Baumeister using tomograms studied it, and so did Sunny Shi. He labeled some of the, he labeled the ribosomes, or he actually labeled a, a protein on the ribosome. And they get approximately the same distribution. We have now seen that in yet another method, right? So uh, for slow growing, we're happy with this distribution coming from these uh, of ribosomes. We now have information from how many ribosomes come from each ribosomal operon. That's just, we haven't even published this yet with a colleague from our Physics Frontier Center. So uh, I, th I think we really have the slow growing uh, down to a T, at least for this part of it. Uh, other, there, and the other reason to do it, and I really stress this, I only have one DNA in there at the moment. If it's a fast growing cell, anybody who studies cell biology knows, oh, there are two, three, maybe four copies of the DNA in there. Well, that means there are two, three, four copies of your gene, and each of them can be being transcribed, so your whole statistical analysis it has mm -hmm. to be accordingly um, you know, uh, treated. And it can be done, but it's another level of complexity. And right now, we're just trying to build up to, to add more and more of the cellular networks in there till we get and, uh, the whole thing in a cell simulation. All right, so let's talk about that lack genetic switch. These are these 25 reactions I was talking to you about. Here's the LAC gene that things saw flickering. There's a repressor sitting on it. There's a permease. And if you have a lot of sugar in the outside, it comes through the permease, binds to the repressor, and the repressor falls off. And it has two binding sites. And then you start making a protein that gets translated by the ribosomes. And that protein is made then here at the membrane. And you have a positive feedback loop. So that's all those reactions take into account. So you have like, for example, uh, here's the repressor with no sugars binding to the gene, with one sugar, with two sugars, and you can see the rates change accordingly. Uh, some of them are really well studied. The one in between, we just took it in between. They knew this one and they knew this one. And then we just said, well, somewhere in between. And it's not critical. We've uh, checked that. What, are, what was more critical was the lifetime of the, of the messengers. So you have the messenger dying, the protein dying, and the messenger being translated. Uh, so it doesn't destroy the messenger, it gives you a protein. Then you have to get the sugars, the inducer, into the cell passively and through the membrane proteins. So, and then I tried to put here sort of typical sources of where one could get the data, say, from single molecule. So those of you who know fish, it's very good at measuring how many messengers are in the cell. Uh, yes. Okay, um, is there any, do you give up any accuracy and information of the, of the, of the cells growing in, in for, for sake of a faster like, approximation method to like the telepathy? Okay, so um, um, what I'll show you in that cell, we don't let it grow at the moment with the, with when we do the well stirred version of this thing, which we can do, we did let that grow because uh, uh, if you, since you know about the Gillespie algorithm, you'll see it in the tutorial. Uh, you know, it's stochastic, so you're really counting molecules, so there are volume corrections, right? And that volume correction and turning it from concentrations into particle numbers, that volume can just be made as a function of time, right? So we checked it on the well stirred version and have an idea about what sort of error it makes. So that's why I'm telling you. That's like one of these, not correcting for the volume is like about a 20 to percent error, but then there are other errors that you do. And you know, uh, uh, right now, one, the attitude that one has to have with these uh, is you cannot you know, put everything into it that you want, uh, because you're right. Uh, if we then put growth into the heterogeneous model, it would really slow it down. We tried to do it in cell division have an outside um, 
agent base method. Um, in fact, that's in, I think, Mike's paper, uh, where we put, uh, uh, we ha have a reaction called the min oscillations, um, which are help uh, to keep the sides of the uh, cell free at about the midpoint. And that allows you to pinch it shut. So we did a agent-based method where we just closed it whenever the side was free. You could do that, it slows things down. But every time we get an improvement in the speed of our GPUs, we put in more complexity. Okay. Right. So like in this problem, we had the ribosomes there. They just didn't move. They were obstacles, right? Yes. And then I uh, met with a single molecule person who measured the diffusion of the ribosomes. And what does he say to me? Let the ribosomes free, <laughs> right? We did. That's in the ribosome <laughs> biogenesis model. And now you want the volume to change. We will do that. That will be in version three, right? Um, but, uh, so it, you just have to make progress. It, yeah. I, you guys were all too young to be around when MD was started, you know, but you're hearing lectures like from my husband for a resource that has had 20 years of MD. And they have built it now to have one of the fastest programs available to do large systems. So I think we're very much in the infancy, right? There's also other methods. In fact, here, I, uh, Marcus can tell you about things that they develop here. It's called M-cell. Uh, there's another one called V-cell. So it's just like everybody does slightly different things. We have really tried to focus in on getting to the speed where we can answer certain questions, right? OK. So um, that's the system that we studied. And uh, one of the co-authors is in the dot, 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 was um, um, also Julio uh, Ortiz and, and Baumeister. So I said we had the ribosomes in there as objects, uh, as uh, obstacles. And one of the things we wanted to do is, like, what about from proteomics data? As this thing grows and you get maybe more proteins in there, how does crowding affect the repressor rebinding. So you start off with some rate constant, right? Maybe one that was measured in a biochemical experiment. And then I hope this movie works, right? So that's the red is a little piece of the DNA, and the white guy is the repressor sitting on it. And the round things, that's our version of the ribosome, right? Uh, and then we put in some of the other packing. So there's about 12 classes. We just made them green and greener, sort of bigger objects, smaller objects. Then I have to take them away so you can watch this thing. But they're there in the simulation. So the repressor comes off, and it diffuses around. It would like to escape and get by some of those ribosomes, right? But this is a, and, and I have to say, most of the time it does. So if you look over there, the rebinding probability is only about 15% uh, at very low packing. Um, because this is 3D, it can wander off, and there'll be another repressor that will come in and then bind to the ribosome, uh, bind to the DNA there. So this is one where it wandered around and then did come back, right? And then we just keep changing the packing and then see how the rebinding probability changes. We also looked at how the packing affects the diffusion coefficients, right? So these are all things that we studied back in this like 2009 article. And now here's an extreme example uh, of like. Again, let's pack in ribosomes, the orange guys, and sort of some of these larger and small complexes. And um, uh, so let's fill up the cytoplasm. So we had to work on an algorithm that would help us to do this quickly, right? And now you look, it looks pretty packed, but let's zoom in. You'll see it looks like a piece of Swiss cheese, right? So mostly what we're doing with the ribosomes, we're using that to say, is that, are those few lattice filled or not filled, right? And then, you, and then you turn that information about obstacles into saying, well, those lattice are not available to our simulation. You know, so you've got to do your reactions around them. Okay? So as I said, now, unfortunately, everything moves. And uh, it takes us a little bit longer. But then through the help of Mike Halleck and NVIDIA, everything increased by a factor of three or six. Um, and then we can let them all be free. But this is what we did, and this is back for this 2011 paper, I think.
okay, where they were obstacles. Here was the experiment we had from Sunny Shi. He had actually measured the switching time. These are all E. coli, but he put a label behind that uh, lac Y, the permease, uh, yellow fluorescent protein. So even in the basal state, you can see that there's several there. There's about an average anywhere from 10 to 50 of these proteins. But when it gets switched on, it gets like a several thousand, and it looks like this yellow coffee bean, right? And the switching on process at about 16, I think it's micromolars, I think that's the right units, of lactose takes about 30, 40, anywhere in that range, 30 to 50 minutes. All right, so each of those bacteria got their own GPUs. Uh, we varied the initial distributions of some of those other crowding agents, ran the simulation, and now it's ticking. And what you'll see out of this, every time you see a burst of pink, it's a messenger being formed. And like this cell will turn on, and one other cell, I've watched this so many times I should know. Uh, I think it's that one, but I'm not sure. Um, with every you see a lot of pink blips. Uh, so two of them will turn on, which is about the percentage he saw. He said roughly one third, so two out of the six should do it. Oh, um, and we're nearing the time. So those two cells have really turned on, and the rest are sort of in their basal background amounts of these premiers, or just in the process of turning. Those are for somewhat fatter cells. These are for slow growing cells or slower growing cells. They are longer and thinner. And again, you're watching the process up there. What we wanted to compare are things like the lifetime of the repressor on the operator. That's in part a volume and concentration uh, effect from the sugars. And these little bouncing blue balls there that go in and out of the nucleoid region and around it are the uh, repressors. And they have slightly different colors depending if they have zero, one, or two sugars on it. And it happens that why the, the, the lifetime goes down so much that it's so, the sugar is so concentrated in these smaller cells that you almost have no repressors with, without some sugar on them. So it really affects the time. We also were predicting the effects of the mRNA uh, location, where you should be finding it on the cell. I think that's still to be validated. And unfortunately, these are still out as predictions. Nobody has really done the two experiments. Uh, but we can do it now that, so that people can really control the lifetime of these cells and the doubling times. OK, so um, the thing I wanted to do now is to go up in, in complexity. So we wanted to look at uh, a kinetic model for ribosome biogenesis. And um, so this is really one that f just transitioned from molecular into the cell. So we had looked for years, all those years, <laughs> uh, at the signatures of evolution, of ribosomal evolution. And in the last paper was with uh, experimentalists, one started to look at um, uh, how they affected the folding and the, the assembly of it. Now, uh, this ribosome. Uh, this is what you know, the three colleagues, uh, Yonath and Seitz and Ramakrishna, the Nobel Prize a couple years ago. It's two complexes, a large co uh, subunit, a small subunit. The small subunit, you know, there, there's uh, brown and, and yellow there. Uh, there's the RNA and the, and the proteins that help hold it together. So uh, there was tons of data on on trying to look at assembly models for this. It's been going on since about seven, 1970, this first starting at the Japanese group. So first we want to make a kinetic model for the assembly. Then we want to put the kinetic model into a cell model. So that was the whole goal. OK? So how would we do that? Let's just concentrate on the small subunit. So uh, the yellow water is the RNA, and those brown objects are all the proteins that come and bind to it and hold it together, right? Now, it has about 20 of those proteins. In principle, you could have two to the 20 estates. Awful. And we know, as I said, really since the 70s, that it, there is the Nomura did it, measured the uh, hierarchical folding map. That uh, he said that there are proteins that come in and bind. They have to be first primary ones who bind directly to the RNA, 
once they're bound, there are proteins that come in and bind to them as well as some part of the RNA. And then there are tertiary ones that come in. So that hierarchical uh, uh, observation gives you a drastic reduction from 2 to the 20 to about 1,600 states. So you can think of it over here. Here's your 16S. You have three proteins that combine. Maybe two of them are primary, but one of them is a secondary. That guy should not bind, and that's going to knock out all those other states that are in a pathway of assembly. Right? So that's how you get this dramatic reduction. So now we want to make a model, and this model uh, for ribosome assembly, we're going to have to consider the fact that we've got actually seven copies of the rRNA gene there on that circular DNA. And that's the picture that we should get for slow-growing uh, uh, slow E. coli uh, for all of the ribosomes coming from all the genes. All right, so to get the model for the ribosome assembly, there were pulse chase experiments. So again, you have to work with the experimentalist to get these kinetic models, or somebody's got to just give it to you. Um, and then you still do a sensitivity analysis. That took half the time to figure out, well, what if the guy made a mistake, or he has a certain uncertainty in his experiments, although he is a co-author on the paper. This is Jamie Williamson. So the dots are his experiments from Pulse Chase. So he has a bunch of... He starts with the RNA, throws the proteins in. He also does some pre-binding studies where he's thrown in all the primary and look at the secondary and tertiary proteins binding. So we try to fit to his data. And uh, you can see a bunch of colored lines. The 1600, you know, we could fit really well, but that was even too many reactions for that present version of the code. You know, if we're going to put in other parts of the network, we can't be giving 1,600 just to the assembly of the ribosome. So we worked our way down to we could get 140 reactions that approximated, that's green, approximate the experiments reasonably well. And now you'll see what happens when you do this simulation on blue waters. So you're not going to want to do this one because this takes three days. Um, uh, but this is what you're asking about. Well, this is with this 32 nanometer resolution. Um, what, what's, this gives you an idea of all the stuff that's in there. Uh, uh, there are proteins. There are ribosomes, small subunit, large subunit. Those are the genes, the seven genes for the R RNA operon and the ribosomal operons. And then we'll just watch the first, say, minute of this because the uh, uh, the formation of a, a small subunit goes actually rather quickly. And so you see translation gets started, translation terminates, the clock is ticking. And uh, we still haven't quite figured out how to represent this data in a meaningful way because we have so much in there now, it's very difficult. Uh, so we showed you some of the intermediates in the ribosome assembly. Um, like when we have half the proteins on the, the ribosome. And they come and go very quickly. There, there's a lot of noise in the intermediate. So there you really do need the, the uh, stochastic treatment of this problem. All right, so we're done with this. Boom. And now I'll just summarize the results for you quickly. So here are these seven sites. And here's like the intermediates. There's a lot of fluctuations to them. And here's the growing number of small uh, subunits. And this is over a 60 minute period. It should be out to 120 minutes. And so we get a couple thousand, if you can, this is a log plot uh, of these new ribosomes being formed. And then we ask ourselves, now we can. Fortunately, this is not done uh, when we had submitted the paper uh, or complete, you know, they hadn't completely finished their experiments on it. But now they have the ribosomes coming in from all seven of those. And our doubling time is right here. And you see, you can hardly read it. It's like a 1,000. So the, we were already very good. Right? And here's their data. They get that data from STORM. And then they check it with qPCR. And here's a typical STORM data. So be prepared also, as a computational biophysicist, you're going to have to help them even interpret their data. You can see very clearly that's a cell, that's a cell. We have distributions on length. And then those dots. That's garbage, we think, on the surface. Then you have to 
rotate it, and then count the dots that are in any one cell. And I think you can see there are a lot of ribosomes at one end and a lot of ribosomes at another end. And this is coming from, I think, the, the, the D operon. All right, a quick word about our method. Did you have a question? No? You get it from storm? Yeah, that's why I rotated. This is looking down. This is uh, being on that plane and looking up. That's that. Those we have X, Y, Z data for this. Okay. Um, wrong way. Um, the speed that one uses. We also have another comparison in the tutorials from a more recent article. This was back in 2013, I think, when we first released the software. Um, and all we're doing here is, and please look, there are two times. So there's CME, there's no spatial heterogeneity. This is with spatial heterogeneity. Uh, this was our closest competitor at that time. That's Johan Elf. He's um, now working with us. Um, but we're, for this, like this lack genetic switch, we would take one to two days. On the then GPU, he would take 83 days. Um, so he just wouldn't do it. Um, and the CME methods, oh, there's an advantage over some of them, but all the CME methods are pretty good, right, in, my, in my opinion. Right? Here's a, a more recent uh, analysis. What, how this whole picture changes, this is from Mike Halleck's paper that's in parallel computing, where we're looking at simulation volumes here. Um, and so this would be the region where you would find E. coli, uh, E. coli and E. coli du doubling. This would be for yeast. This would be like a red blood cell. And these various lines in, uh, refer to the lattice size, 16 or 8, and time steps, and whether you have 1 to 8 GPUs on it. So what you would like to have as few days as possible to get you one hour of the life of E. coli. So over here, you're seeing like this is about a day to do an hour of E. coli. And if you're using you know, as many GPUs as you can and at this uh, resolution. If you go over now and just look how things changed in about nine months, go to supercomputing, get a different GPU. These are four K420s. These were 2070s. Uh, that whole sets of curves just moved down. So now you're doing reactions in E. coli within a, a fraction of a day. Now, uh, with benchmarks, uh, you always have to take them with a grain of salt because you have to be running the same kind of reactions in each of the systems. So this was for sort of a relatively small number of reactions. What's going to be interesting is what happens when you run that biogenesis model and all of them, or at least 1,200 reactions. So that takes about three days, as I was saying. Um, and that's running it with this little bit faster GPU. And be sure that you've got the most recent uh, version of the uh, NVIDIA software running. Uh, if you use older ones, it's going to be slower, right? And so here's a curve that, that Mike made. Uh, this was running it on these faster computers with the 6.5. This would be like what we used to do, neat time we would have, runtime milliseconds per to do those 1,200 reactions or by the number of reactions, so going like this. And then when you m improve the code a bit, and he can tell you what JIT code means. And with these faster GPUs, the whole thing dropped down in time. And I don't think we still know exactly why these blips are there, but he might have a better idea, right? Uh, so we've run it so many times. Um, all right, so what we've done so far is I've talked to you about a genetic switch model, and we've talked about uh, building whole kinetic models for this genetic information processing. Uh, there's this other big block. So this is up all the reactions in the networks in, say, E. coli. So um, we have done each of these individually. The big effort now is to combine them together. And so you translation, transcription, we talked about. Uh, we need the central metabolism. We need amino acid biosynthesis. Uh, we've worked on those, but only on the, the steady state 
uh, networks and then updating them from uh, changes into and out of the cell, which I'll show you next then. But that gives you a, a feel for the magnitude of the problem. If you're, you've done half of it and now you want to couple it with the rest of it. All right. So again, I think for those of you who know something about metabolism, I think you're all familiar with glycolysis, carbohydrate, TCA cycle, amino acid biosynthesis. I'm sure systems that you guys are working on are located in these uh, polygons somewhere. And, and that gives you roughly a, a, a sense of how much of the reactions of the some 2,500 reactions for E. coli are taken up by each of these pr processes. All right, so one way to do this, at least for the metabolism, is if here you have a cell and you have things coming into the cell and then they go into, say, networks, and what those networks do is they make ribosomes and DNA and, and proteins and that contributes overall to the biomass, you can ask about the steady state fluxes through any parts of this network, provided you know what, what comes in, and you should. You try to do these experiments under well-defined conditions so you know how much glucose you have, how much oxygen, you know, how much amino acids, you know what's in the medium, right? And then you try to solve for the steady state flux through those reactions. That's called flux balance analysis. And here's just a representation of all those reactions, our columns here, and plus whatever you're taking up, the thing that you're trying to maximize, it's biomass in this case, and you have the metabolites here. Now, uh, to, when I say you try to get the steady state fluxes here, you're trying to get the corresponding flux vectors here uh, at steady state conditions. So things are not changing anymore. And you can do what they call constrained FBA. So you will have some knowledge about what's flowing in here, but you probably will also know uh, other restrictions. So what if, for example, there were no proteins being made in this part of the network? Well, you would expect zero flux through it then. And where are you going to get that information? You're going to get that from single molecule studies. They have labeled these things in huge efforts for several of the model compounds under a few conditions, like giving it maybe glucose high or low uh, certain nitrogen compounds. So you have information that you can use to put upper bounds on these fluxes. Because if you remember from, again, from Michael Menten theory, your fluxes are proportional to the amount of enzyme you have plus the KCAT for that reaction. Now the problem is, where do you get the information about the KCATs? So biochemistry, while not as systematic as structural biology in terms of writing down what all those KCATs are, like you, you, know, you have the PDB database just growing with more and more structures, they do put them into a database. It's called the Brenda database. It, it's a short an acronym for the Braunschweig Enzymatische Datenbus that's in Braunschweig, Germany. And it's like their... Um, like their NIST, their, uh, it's a, where they collect scientific information. And everybody reports it there. And of course, half the time, you're never going to get the KCAT exactly under the conditions you're working with, but you'll get an idea of the variation in KCATs that are there that you can use to do your sensitivity analysis. So now, what you can do is you can use all the expression data, proteomics data uh, that you know, uh, you can also use experimental fluidic devices, which gives you distributions of proteins that's in maybe 500 different proteins, uh, 500 different cells. So there's some cells that have a, a lot of this protein. Some of them have very little. On average, they have this amount of them. So you can computationally generate a million different cells sampling out of these distributions and putting constraints on the fluxes through parts of them, right? And so this is what this diagram is showing you. And so instead of getting one growth rate by maximizing to get the bio, bio flux, um, uh, the largest number possible, you'll get a whole distribution of growth rates. And so there'll be cells growing slowly and some growing fast. And then this is what they measure experimentally for the growth rate. That's what they, when they're doing the optical density, that's all they're able to see.
until late. This was 2013. Since 2013, there have been several articles now where they're at least beginning to look at the growth rate for micro colonies. And it's not quite down to the single cell level yet, but they're aiming in that direction. So this is data that we used from, uh, we got this distributions from Sunny Shee's data. We did this curve and we looked at correlated and uncorrelated uh, sampling um, because again, what's in a cell, we know there's regulation, um, how should we include that information? So we, we tried to do that. And all I want to show you is you can study at what's going on in these cells um, as a function of their growth rate. These dots all indicate cells and they're using different pathways. So at a very low growth rate, they're using primarily the glycolysis pathway. And as they start speeding up, they start using the so-called ED pathway, has fewer proteins. So you're sort of trading ATP, but having smaller protein costs. So you're seeing a balance of these use of the pathways. You can go and look at the slow growing, really slow growing cells, and you'll see that they're secreting acetate and go over and mark the fluxes onto those metabolic pathways and you can see that that is something that is secreted and as you go to the high growth it no longer secretes acetate it gives off CO2 through the TCA cycle. All of those have been validated now through experiments and what's more interesting in my opinion is the fact that these curves are now popping up in other model organism also under low sugar conditions but they're not secreting acetate down here. They're doing, these guys are secreting up here CO2 and a lot of ethanol, right? Uh, but uh, it's a very similar pattern. Now, in the last part of this lecture, I just want to tell you how you start combining dynamics with uh, this metabolic steady state picture. So at any instance that you give me, we c one can solve this and get the steady state fluxes through parts of this. But what if the environment changes and it changes with time, right? So uh, this is these hybrid methods. And so here's your cells, a million cells. We start off with a single cell in a Petri dish and it grows up to like a million cell colony. And now I just want to remind you that our lattices are 10 microns now, so we have not one cell, but many cells in each of these lattice places. And we're watching them grow, and the substrates diffuse. So you have here the substrates are diffusing around, so some cells will see more oxygen, some will see more sugar, and then that affects the input into these metabolic models, and that says, well, now I'll use this part of the pathway, the TCA cycle, or under other, this cell over here might use that pathway and secrete acetate. Out of those FBA models, those steady state models for that instance in time, so here our time steps are milliseconds, uh, we'll get a growth rate. And that growth rate then goes in and affects the cells. So we have a, a cutoff that says once the cell volume here at this lattice site gets more than like 80% filled, then the cells have to go into the neighboring cells. And it starts spreading out and you keep on doing this cycle again and again and again. You can watch them grow. Here we have, and you can see where oxygen starts getting depleted in the center of the colony. You can see where glucose, there's a ton of it in the agar, gets depleted slightly, but still these guys are getting a glucose, but they're not seeing very much at the top of the colony. And what's more important is you can do now a simulation. These are different packing densities. I told you we did one for 80%, 65%, and 50%. That just affects how quickly it expands. And these are cells where we have labeled uh, um, different enzymes in those pathways. Right? And so we're trying to compare our curve. So really the 80% was a pretty good uh, patch to, uh, or a pretty good agreement to all of these. And these uh, shapes indicate different times. So one could go up to 40 minutes with that software. Now we don't have it in the tutorial yet because we just, uh, the paper was just accepted at the beginning of the year, but the software is available on our website along with the tutorial if you're interested in this, right? So here's the results. This is what I'm particularly proud of because 
as I said, validating cell simulations is really difficult. So I, uh, the DOE gave me uh, funds for an experimental postdoc who then works in the lab of my colleagues there in the Physics Frontier Center. And what we did is we did a two-color experiment where we put in a plasmid with the promoter, say, of PTSG, which is this first step in the glycolysis uptake, and then one uh, like this particular plasmid had one that was either showing us something going on in the TCA cycle or in the secretion pathway or uptake pathway of uh, acetate. And um, so you notice ones with M cherry. So M cherry reports to us about glucose utilization. Green reports to us about acetate utilization. So after 30 to 40 hours, this is what our cell looked like, what we predicted it would look like. The guys at the top should be uh, consuming acetate, and the guys at the bottom should, um, they should be glowing red, and they should be consuming uh, glucose and producing acetate. And here are the results on the right-hand side from the experiments. So we went with a microscope and did optical sectioning. So the guys at the top, up here at the top, uh, you see only the green. And the guys at the bottom, you see only the red with a little faint green a circle around it. Right? So uh, this is what you have to do to even validate these. But, uh, and then from the side view, just going a vertical cut through it, you see the, uh, the same pattern. So uh, this is one where we're able to do it. And I have to say, um, it did two things for us. It, it gave us confidence in the computational methodology we develop, but I'd like to say it's like any field, you know, in MD, you sit on the shoulders of a lot of work from other people. The fact that these metabolic pathways are now to the level for the model organisms, you can do predictions and they, and they work out, it speaks for this whole field of systems biology and we work particularly carefully or, or closely together with a group in San Diego uh, from Bernard Paulson. He's been one of the real leaders in developing and validating the metabolic networks for E. coli. But every model organism has that set of colleagues and you have to decide whether it's at a state where you can use it to do these kinds of large simulations, right? Okay, so as I said, our goal is to put reduce networks for all the cellular processes. So we'll put all transcription, we'll combine those two parts of that previous blocky map. Uh, and then we can then look at how the local environment affects the, how is its signals passed on to regulation, meta whoop, metabolism, and translation. And so we can look at the cellular responses. So now just a quick word about the tutorials and then we can all go for lunch. Um, as I said, we're gonna run all the lattice microbe tutorials on Blue Waters. If you do have a GPU, the right one on your laptop, you can try running something, but you gotta run it for at least, and if you do something switching. I had one of my students come in and join the group and he said, I ran it, it didn't switch. And I go, how long did you run it? Oh, about a minute. No, oh. yeah. it takes 20 minutes at least to see it. And then it could be, you know, 22 minutes with one, or it could be 15 minutes. So uh, you want statistics, please do run it on the blue waters. Uh, we have a, a lot going on in that tutorial. Uh, we do simple reactions so you get a, a feel for what it means to run something deterministically versus stochastically. We do the lac genetic switch. Uh, we do these oscillations, min oscillations that leads to cell division. Those take a while, so everything is pre-computed for that. If you want to look at the results, analyze them, you can do that. Uh, these are just looking at these waves as a function of time and the density, and so this is like the cell axis, so <coughs> it should be less of those molecules at the midpoint, and that's where it gets pinched together. The, uh, Joe has developed a really nice flow chart of how the reaction goes. So, if you start off with the simulation, and that instance means your system, right? um, you've got to decide, do I have spatial heterogeneity? Do I need to have it? 
If yes, then I better go to find the regions. Is it, the me is it membrane? Like that takes the membrane reaction to cytoplasm, outside, inside, nucleoid. If we're going to do the yeast uh, system, that's got like, well, depending on le at least four to nine compartments uh, are, can be involved in there. All right. So then you have to go to find those regions. If you don't, this is the pathway to CME. Just put the reactions in and run them. And sometimes we just do that to see if we're in the rough ballpark, right, uh, of having the rate constants being assigned. Uh, otherwise, if you continue on, so you make that, you know, visit to defining regions, start adding all your reactions. If you're wanting to do heterogeneity, then you better pack be give it the geometry well where is the where are the mitochondria where is the nucleoid where is the outside of the cell right then you're going to have to discretize it if you don't want heterogeneity then just keep on after ask, uh, after you've added the reactions just keep on running it and then uh, analyze your data so we'll have pictures that pop out at the end so you can take a look what's going on and can analyze it so for example uh, I've asked Joe, and he'll give a little presentation. When do you guys come back for the afternoon session? Is it 2 or 2.30? Two. 2. All right, so at 2, I've asked Joe to give you a demonstration of how to use his uh, Python LM uh, interface to set up shapes. Like, so this is going to be yeast in a minute. So, oop, hey, it's supposed to be yeast. So there's the big red guy is the cell nucleus, uh, and you have mitochondria, they'll have nuclear pore complexes, a vacuole in there, and you can make all these shapes uh, to set up a model system. Uh, even when we get the tomograms now for yeast, we're, we're going to simplify them, coarse grain them, because we cannot deal with all the complexities of shape, uh, so we have to have idealized uh, uh, systems, right, for our preliminary analysis. Okay, so he'll demonstrate how you can do that. And then what's the most important thing is to show you all the people that are involved in this. So um, these are some of my experimental collaborators. Fortunately, my longtime collaborator, Carl Bowes, died a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, this is Tom Kuhlman. His group are measuring those things coming from the individual operons. TAKIP is doing these single molecule studies also on the, on the ribosome. Uh, these, uh, this is Wolfgang Baumeister. This is Elizabeth Vila, who's now a, a junior uh, assistant professor at UCSD. She's the ones providing us with tomograms for, the, uh, for yeast and other eukaryotes. And most importantly, they developed a technique called focus ion beam milling, which allows you to slice any fatter cell into slabs, and then the computer recompiles it so we know where all the big objects are. And from these guys, we know where the smaller objects are. And so we're trying to combine the single molecule, with, as I said, with the cryo-M people. Uh, Tyler is the uh, physics student who's done the simulations on the, uh, on the ribosome biogenesis. And he really worked very closely with, with Joe and with Mike in pushing our software, that curve that Mike made to show how fast, uh, faster you can now simulate reactions. The faster you can do that, the more reactions, the more of the networks you can put in. And then it's just like with MD. Oh, well, once you can do every damn atom, you'll want to then make a coarse grain model, you know, because they'll just make things go faster. But, I, you know, we all would love to be able to do the everything model and then simplify. So it's a little in between what we're doing, but we try to increase the complexity and then reduce it to the minimum number that we need, we, we need like in the ribosome assembly model. I think it's a very important, whether you're doing MD simulations or you're doing cell simulations, it's the same mentality. Right? And um, these two students worked on uh, the um, population FBA and the hybrid method to do push it on to colonies. And I think all of you must know John Stone. He's sort of the gatekeeper to VMD. Uh, and he was helping us also with the plug-in, because VMD is so used to looking at atoms and molecules, 
we had to really develop a special plug-in to make it look at cells and probabilities of cells to be in certain regions, right? So it's an enormous effort that takes, you know, many, many people working on it and many different funding agencies because it's like um, NIH has, is not interested normally in ARCHIs. That's in the realm of the DOE because uh, they make, the ones I work on make methane. Um, so they like those. Uh, so it's like uh, you have to work with a lot of people and with a lot of different funding agencies to get this uh, uh, to completion. Yeah, so um, I think that's it. Are there any questions about this part of it? That, that have any more questions? Yeah? So um, for the simulations that you showed, all those were visualized using DMD? Um, Was the shape ones, was that used, did that use VMD, that final yeast one? I'm asking Joe. Yes. Yeah. And, okay, but, not all, but shh, it stays in Pittsburgh, you know. What happens here stays here. So, uh, what happens is, and as I said, because VMD has been developed primarily to do molecular dynamics simulations, and we do have a plug-in that do, does the cell, it's never exactly where you want to have it. So particularly this guy, uh, and I have to stop him at times, he'll just go write his own visualization program, right? Pavre, or, uh, and, then, and then John Stone will look at that and say, well, you can do all of that in VMD, you just have to do these commands. But you've got to have the little script that does it until, and wait until it becomes a button in VMD, like under representations, you know, show me this, show me just the nucleoid region. So those pictures on the ribosome biogenesis, he did that with Pavre, right? He has a version of it in, in, uh, in VMD, um, and, but if you want to look at the data, you just have to do whatever method you can to look at it, right? But we do, ha we do try to have it all come uh, through uh, VMD if possible. Right, because there's just so much more knowledge. I mean, uh, John Stone advises us on everything from the GPUs. I mean, that's where they're used to accelerate the graphics, right? Um, he and um, um, uh, Mike Halleck both have non-disclosure agreements with NVIDIA so they can get the latest and greatest improvements in the GPUs to help with the running of the program and the visualization of the program. So. But I, I don't know about you, I just hate to have to learn too many different programs because once we give out this and we come and teach it as a tutorial, we want you to be able to reproduce it because normally you guys see something you like, that's how we are, oh, how the hell do they do that, right? And you want to do the same thing. And if you have too many different programs uh, going on, it's hard to do that, right? So uh, that's always our goal, to make it as few as possible. Right. Anything else? Mm -hmm. so I wonder, given kind of from the experimental side, we have uh, from a couple of years ago, maybe longer than that, the first synthetic um, bacteria, mm -hmm. you know, the first uh, synthetic uh, yeast tumors, and I, is it here you can simulate life or simulate cells? I don't simulate. I don't say I simulate life. I don't want to get into trouble. I mean, Carl had enough of that. He had. Can we turn off this mic? <laughs> <laughs> sure you will. Okay. Yes, you can simulate a cell. You can. I. I. Th I, I think I see where you're going. So, I think the uh, yeast. Ha ha ha. You know. Did you see where that was on the volume? I mean, that's so much bigger. You know, they only feel confident, and we're on version seven of the yeast uh, model. Uh, there's a whole consortium doing the human. Uh, we're on reconstruction two or three with that. So that's far off. E. coli, I think we're pr getting closer than you think, right? Uh, I, before he graduates and before Joe graduates, I want all the reactions in E. coli. And, that, and so they're putting lots of pressure on Mike because we need things faster and more species and more reactions, right? And, but I think it's doable. And in part, 
because we know the reactions and we know how to simplify them. Right? And so uh, I'm sure you'll come up with something, yeah, but can you do it when you feed it glycerol? Uh, probably, right? Um, uh, I think we're closest to that because we have the geometry, we're okay. Um, and there's so much known about E. coli. There's so much, there's proteomic studies done under so many different conditions. There's Sunny's data. There's uh, people are labeling these things. You just have so many ways to check your simulations and then put all the information together. And so I'm very optimistic about that. Yeast, I'm less so. Human, ha. You know, it's a uh, go pick a cell maybe in the liver or uh, like someone who saw our cell simulations, the colony simulations, a cancer researcher came and asked, well, can't you grow that, a cancer cell on agar? And it's been done, the, uh, uh, and, but it grows into the agar. So you, uh, and I don't want that because that's really hard to do the optical sectioning. And you, you, you need to stay quantitative, define conditions that you can compare it. So uh, if they can grow it on a more solid, firmer um, agar, yes. Like you can test out some things like, Maybe a tumor cell gives off, uh, I don't know, more acetate. Maybe it takes up less oxygen. Or you can see a differential growth uh, rate uh, in it. That you might be able to, uh, to simulate. But it's going to be sort of more on that hybrid level where you'll do steady state on the cellular networks because you really don't have the kinetic parameters for them in, in, in humans. You have a handful. You know, they've, for the key metabolic networks in yeast, they have rate constants. That was just published in Science uh, last December, right? But humans are far away, right? Next workshop. <laughs> workshop in 10 years. <laughs> you guys will hold it. That's what I think, right? Okay, anything else? No? Okay, so uh, why don't we break for lunch, and then at 2 o'clock, uh, we'll have, uh, Mike, you'll start with how to get on to Blue Waters. Is that correct? Or how are you guys doing this? Yeah, because we want to check that you guys all can get on. Because I think it's fun to use the supercomputer if you haven't done it. I, and I... I, we know this works. I've, I teach a course on computational biophysics, and I have about 30 students, and they all got accounts. And, they, and uh, so I think it's, it's worth giving it a try. And I, hopefully Mike will explain just a little bit about the supercomputer and that we, our biggest problem was with the, in the class, everyone wanted to put it, they wanted to run everything on the head node. And they go, hey guys, we got, Thousands of GPUs. Don't everybody go for this node, please, right? And it just, we brought down our local system, which happened to be my system. So uh, I, I said a, maybe a two minute lecture about clusters and high performance computing if you guys have never done it. I know for some of you it'll be a real bore, but uh, you might want to hear about it. And he's an expert, right? Okay, so have a nice lunch and I'll see you all back at two, two o'clock, right? <laughs>